you notice this morning as we open up the Word of God that that we are once again dealing with another parable about the kingdom of heaven. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells a total of, of 10 of these kingdom of heaven parables, and it's because of the fact that the kingdom of heaven is, is just central to the ministry of Jesus Christ. It's impossible to read through the Gospel of Matthew and not to pick up on the fact that the kingdom of heaven is just a foundational part of the teaching of Jesus Christ. And yet sometimes when you talk to Christians today, sometimes you notice that they talk about the kingdom of heaven in kind of an abstract sort of way. So, so they'll, they'll talk about the kingdom of heaven as if it is something that they have to look forward to. They talk about the kingdom of heaven as if it is something that they will experience. And, and, and while that is true in the full sense of the kingdom of heaven, the reality is that the blessings of the kingdom of heaven and the gifts of the kingdom of heaven and the power of the kingdom of heaven, those are things that we get to experience already today. I right, think of Paul early on in Colossians. Paul says that you are, you are taken from the dominion of darkness and you are brought into the kingdom of the son he loves. The fact is that the blessings and the gifts and the power of the kingdom of heaven are a reality that we already get to experience today, and so the result is that it has to impact our lives today. I mean, the difficult truth, the extremely blunt truth that Jesus Christ is going to bring home in this parable is that our lives, the way that we live, the way that we treat other people they are, in fact, an indicator of which kingdom we are living for. Jesus is making clear that kingdom citizens are different because their lives and their hearts are reflective of the king that they serve. God's people don't do what they want because they're called to do what God wants. And Paul gets back to this point later on in Colossians, in chapter 3, the verses 12 and 13. And I want to share those words with you this morning. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, you could say as kingdom citizens, people holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You see, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it calls us to follow him, to follow his character, to follow his example even in the most profoundly difficult areas of life. And that's what Paul goes on to say. He says, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgiveness Forgiveness is perhaps the hardest thing that God calls us to. But forgiveness is a mark of the kingdom. See, forgiveness is not optional in the Christian life because it is the very heartbeat of the Christian life. And so today, this morning, I want to explore God's command to forgive as God forgave you. There's two elements that I want to look at in this parable. I want to begin by just talking about the extent of God's forgiveness. Now, as I said earlier, this, this passage, this whole conversation about forgiveness, it really begins with Peter coming to Jesus with a question. Peter asks in verse 21, he says, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Now, it's easy for us, from our perspective, to look at Peter and to say, well, Peter, why would you put a number on it? I mean, it kind of seems like a shallow perspective. But the thing is, that's not being entirely fair to Peter. Because if you understand it, Peter's question itself, it implies that he understood that Jesus was calling them to a radically different perspective on forgiveness. Because Peter, within his context, especially within the context of the Jewish law, the Jewish norm, was required to forgive someone up to three times. And so what Peter is proposing is actually kind of extreme. 
because he recognizes that Jesus is calling his followers to go above and beyond in the way that they deal with other people. So he's coming to Jesus and he's saying, Lord, if I double the norm, if I go twice as far as everybody else goes, and if I even add a freebie of forgiveness, if I even add that on top, well, is that enough? Is that a radical enough perspective on forgiveness? We have to understand this morning that Peter comes and he desires to be gracious. But here's the problem with Peter. And here's the problem with us. If we want to venture down this road where we talk about how we ought to treat others and what we ought to do for others, we always, always have to begin by reflecting on what God has done for us. You have to. A heart that is truly shaped and molded for forgiveness does not start by first giving grace. You see, a heart is ultimately shaped for forgiveness by experiencing grace, by receiving grace. And that's exactly the point that Jesus wants to make to Peter. So he says to Peter, no, Peter, not up to seven times. Up to 77 times. He says, Peter, you're not even close. He says, Peter, you are way off the mark. The reason that you don't understand the nature of forgiveness, the radical perspective of forgiveness, is because you don't understand the radical nature of God's forgiveness to you. And so that's why he goes down this road of telling the parable. And Jesus begins, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Now, it's difficult to calculate exactly how much uh, 10,000 bags of gold would be worth today. But because I love you and uh, I am concerned about your knowledge of random facts, I took the time this week to do calculations. So I learned from my friends at Google that one bag of gold, which is the equivalent of one talent, weighs about 33 kilograms. Now, the price of gold trading Wednesday afternoon was about $40,600 US dollars per kilogram. Times it by 33, you end up with a sum of about $1.3 million per gold bag, US dollars. Then you got to times it by the 10,000, add in the Canadian conversion, carry the one, Anyway, I'm not going there. My point is this. It was billions of dollars. Billions. Another way to think about it would be that at the time of Jesus' ministry, one gold bag, one talent, would be the equivalent of about 15 to 20 years of a laborer's wage. So Jesus was saying that this guy is indebted to the king to the tune of 150,000 to 200,000 years of labor. I mean, it's just this astronomical number. It's huge. It's unimaginable. And the reason Jesus picks it is because he wants to make clear that the amount is something that he could not possibly overcome. It's insurmountable. And the point that Jesus is making in this parable is he's saying that servant is you. And that servant is me. Right? Not with gold, But our debt is with sin, with sin piled up before God higher than we could possibly, possibly imagine. The gospel confronts us with the reality that where we stand as sinners and where we need to be as right with God is a distance that is so huge that it will never be conquered by us. It will never be conquered on our own. It's the whole point of the gospel is to confront you with the reality that you are in a hopeless, helpless desperate situation. You are the servant. I mean, if you don't understand this part of the gospel, then you will not and you cannot understand the rest. I mean, if you do not actually see yourself as that hopeless, helpless servant, then you will miss the grace of God. We need to be brought to a stage where our reality, our reality, it actually just drives us to our knees, right? Where it drives us to our knees, where it causes us to beg for grace and for mercy. And that's ultimately what happens with this servant. 
We're told that he falls to his knees and he just, he just begs. He just begs, but then listen, listen to what he says. He says this, he says, be patient with me. Be patient, he says, give me some time and I'll pay everything back. The words of his mouth, they suggest that he does not actually grasp the seriousness of his situation. The words of his mouth, they show us that his eyes aren't actually open to how helpless he is. I mean, the king could have given him a thousand lifetimes and he would never have paid that debt back. If anything, the king should have just been enraged. The king could have looked at him and said, you're a liar. You and I both know that you will never, ever pay that total back. It's just impossible. And yet, this is what the man says. And then we're told that the king, instead of being angry, we're told that the king, he looks at this man on his knees. He looks at this man who is begging, and he has compassion on him. He has mercy on him. He cancels his debt, and he lets him go. It's one of these passages that is an un believably clear picture of the gospel. I mean, the message itself, let's be honest, the message itself is pretty clear. The message itself is pretty straightforward. What's hard is the application of the message. What's hard is the implication of the message. I want to suggest this morning that this part of the parable challenges us to ask three questions of ourselves. And the first is this, do you understand the seriousness of sin? I mean, do you actually understand that? Do you understand it, and are you willing to look into your own life? Are you willing to look into your own hearts and truly have a picture of who you are by nature? If I were to ask you, if I were to ask you to evaluate your last week, would you be content because there were no, there were no major sins in your past week? I mean, let's be honest, is it possible that you're here this morning and you're quite content because your past week was just filled with the regular sins? We need to understand that nowhere in the Word of God do you get the idea that sin is a little deal to Him. Do you understand the seriousness of sin? Second question, do you understand the cost? I mean, ultimately, and all of, that's the question, do you understand the cost? Because the gospel says that our debt, it wasn't, just, it wasn't just canceled, our debt was paid in full. And so I could frame this question another way and I could simply ask you, do you love Christ above everything else? Do you love Christ above everything else? Because if you do not, then you don't understand the cost. It is the cost that Christ was willing to pay that breaks our hard hearts as we are reminded that God loved us enough to send his son to pay a life, a perfect life. Our pride and our arrogance, it's broken and we're driven to our knees when we realize that Christ was willing to step into our hopeless, helpless situation and to pay a debt for us that we could never, ever pay. I mean, do you understand the cost? And then finally, do you understand your own personal need for forgiveness? There is no one that is born into this world without a need for forgiveness. And I think the beautiful thing about preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ each and every week, is that there is no one who is beyond it. Every time you share the gospel of Jesus Christ, you get to remind people that those who fall to their knees and those who, who seek the grace and the mercy of God, you get to tell them that they will find it. No one's beyond it. The guy who owed 200,000 years of labor, he's not beyond it. So there's no one who comes here this morning with a debt that God cannot forgive. 
no one that comes here with a, Christ, a price that Christ cannot pay. There is always forgiveness with God. There's always grace. But you know, this is where the parable suddenly becomes extremely difficult. Because up until this point, we've been talking about the fact or focusing on the extent of the grace that we receive from God. But now, now Jesus takes it another direction and he says, the grace that you receive from God, it must impact the grace that you show to others. Right? Jesus teaches this very, very plain biblical truth that receiving grace and showing grace, they go together. They are in Separable. This is one of the most difficult truths in all of Scripture for us to actually live out in our lives. The teaching is clear, it's the living out that is hard because our hearts, what they want is absolutely contrary to that. What our hearts want is when we are offended, we want to be angry and we want to rage and we want to slander and we want to gossip, we want to do everything else. That's what our hearts want. And yet Paul says in Ephesians 4, Paul says, get rid of all bitterness. Get rid of all anger, rage, brawling, slander, along with every form of evil. Be kind and compassionate to one another. And here it comes again. Forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. I want to be very clear this morning that Jesus Christ is calling us to a different way of living. He's calling us to a different way of living, a life that is hard, a life that comes with difficulty, a life where some of the things that we do run absolutely contrary to what we want. And it is a life that is only possible, a life that is only possible when you have been impacted changed, renewed, regenerated, ultimately impacted by the grace of the gospel. Who we are, everything that we do, it all comes back to the grace of God. It all comes back to the love of Christ towards us. It all comes back to the spirit that dwells in our hearts. It all comes back. It always comes back to the grace of God. That's the thing. The grace of God is the only thing that ultimately changes people. It's always grace. And this is where Jesus goes in this parable. He says this first servant, this one who has just been forgiven this, this unbelievable debt, we're told that he goes and he immediately finds another man who owes him some money. I want you to notice something about the text. I want you to notice that this first servant, he doesn't just bump into the other servant. Okay, it's not like he leaves the king's court and he, he walks home and he accidentally runs into this other guy. No, no, no. This guy has just been forgiven an unbelievable debt. And what does he do? He goes and he leaves. He seeks out and we're told that he finds. He finds someone who owes him some money. He finds someone who owes him a hundred silver coins. Now the math on a silver coin is a bit easier. It was about an average laborer's day wage. So the guy is looking for someone who owes him essentially about three months worth of labor. Not a small amount. It's not nothing. But comparatively, comparatively, it was nothing compared to the grace that he had just received. This guy... The first servant, he was the guy that should have left the king's court just dancing with joy. He should have been the most transformed, happiest guy in the whole kingdom. I mean, think about this for a second. Think about this. Imagine that tomorrow morning you wake up and you're at home having your morning coffee and there's a knock on the door and uh, you open the door and it's uh, someone from the bank. They stop by. And they say, hey, you know this whole bit about your, your mortgage. Yeah, your mortgage. We're, uh, we're going to cancel it. No big deal. 
no big deal. Come on, just, I know it's hard to imagine, but let's just say. They say they cancel the debt. Would you not be overwhelmed with joy? You would get to that weird, awkward stage where you don't know whether to laugh or, or to cry, and then you get that person in between. I mean, I honestly could say I'd probably be afraid to run into you tomorrow because your happiness would just be <laughs> a lot to take. This guy should have been the happiest person in the kingdom. And yet he goes and he finds another servant and he grabs him by the neck and he says, pay me back what you owe me. There's a violence, there is a wickedness in this servant that's actually hard to comprehend. He's a guy that, that truly shows by his actions that he has not been transformed by grace. Right? He shows by his actions that he has not been impacted by the grace of the king because the other servant falls to his knees exactly like he did and begs him and says, please be patient, be patient, give me some time, I'll pay. And the fact is that, that this servant could have paid back the amount if he was given time. It was not an amount that was, was insurmountable. He could have paid it back. And if anybody should have been gracious, it was that first servant. And yet he takes the guy and he has him thrown in jail. It's this incredible act of injustice. Incredible act of injustice, but the injustice is brought to the attention of the king. And so he calls in that first servant. And the king says to him, the king says to him, you wicked servant. He said, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. You ever notice that the king doesn't say, I canceled it because you promised to pay me back? The king knew that that would never be a reality. He canceled the debt because you begged me. And so he says, shouldn't you have shown mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? This morning I want you to hear the words of the king. There was an expectation of transformation. There was an expectation on behalf of the king that the radical nature of the grace that he had received would cause him to radically show grace to others, and yet this man showed no appreciation for grace at all. Think about it. He was offered the greatest gift that you could possibly imagine, a gift that would have changed his entire life. He should have led an incredible life of thankfulness, and yet he remains hardened in sin. He's a man who's full of wickedness. He rejects the grace of the king. And Jesus makes clear that rejecting the, the grace of the king is a rejection that comes with a severe penalty. And Jesus closes the parable with a severe warning. Jesus says, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Forgiveness, it is a mark of the kingdom. Now notice that Jesus is not trying to teach that forgiveness is what gives you access to the kingdom. What Jesus is saying is that forgiveness is an unavoidable result it's an unavoidable byproduct of being brought into the kingdom. He's saying that showing grace and receiving grace, they cannot be separated. The grace of God is what shapes our perspective on forgiveness. But I think I have to say this morning too that the grace of God is also what shapes our perspective on repentance. If you are someone who is here this morning and you have to admit in your heart that you are guilty of offending or hurting or sinning against someone, then it is the grace of God that needs to drive your repentance. It is the grace of God that should ultimately bring you to your knees, should drive you to your knees to confess your sin before God and before others. The grace of God 
causes you not to start by looking at someone else and saying, well, they did that, or they did that, or my circumstances were this, or they said that, or, or all of these things. The grace of God says, I start here. The grace of God says, I start with me. I look at my own sin. I look at my own life. I recognize the seriousness of sin, and I recognize the serious consequences that it has. True repentance is not a repentance that comes with this expectation of what someone owes you. True repentance, godly repentance, it means that you recognize that even when there is forgiveness, that you might have a relationship that does not remain the same. That is the attitude that is driven by the grace of God and a godly perspective on repentance. But if you are someone here that's been offended, if you are on the opposite end of the scale where you truly have been hurt or someone has sinned against you, then I also say that God's word is calling you to be driven by the grace of God. You see, we are all we're all offenders in the sight of God. We're all offenders in the sight of God. And the grace that God has shown towards us, the price that Christ has paid for us, it is no small sum. And that has to impact the way that we treat others. Forgiveness is an incredibly difficult thing, perhaps the most difficult calling of all. And yet God's word says you are called to forgive as he forgave us. It is a mark of the kingdom. And what it does is it shows to a world around us that the grace of God is impacting our lives not just for eternity, but the grace of God and the power of Christ and the work of his spirit, those things are impacting our lives already today. Let's pray. Lord God, Lord, as we come, help us to truly have hearts that are moved by your forgiveness. This morning, in your word, you expose us to a truth that is very, very difficult for us to actually apply to our own hearts and our own lives. We are exposed to a calling of forgiveness that runs against everything that we naturally want to do. It calls us to be very, very different than the way we are naturally wired. And yet we are reminded in your word that it is possible and it is possible through the grace that you've shown us. God, as we leave here today, would you open up our eyes to just our own situation? Would you, would you by your spirit, give us hearts that truly examine our own hearts, that look at our own lives, that look at our own shortcomings, not looking right away to the faults of others, but saying, Lord, I need help. Lord, I'm a sinner. God, may we call out to you. May we fall on our knees because of our own shortcomings. May we, may we be driven to, to truly desire your grace and your mercy and your love. And may we be comforted this morning knowing that you give it through Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.